Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 4 of West's Respiratory Physiology textbook. In this chapter we're going over blood flow and metabolism, essentially going to cover how respiratory gases are removed from the lung and also how the lung has a role in metabolism as well. It does mention some key points that every reader should be able to get out of this chapter but we will cover all of these. And remember this diagram up here kind of shows you a simplified version of the alveoli and then your blood flow coming through here through your capillary but really the capillaries are more of a network all the way around the alveoli so it forms this sheet of blood covering one single alveoli and that's really the point they're trying to make up the top here so starting off we're going to talk about the pressures within the pulmonary blood flows the pressure within the pulmonary circulation is a lot lower than the pressure in the systemic circulation we have two circulations, remember the systemic circulation getting pumped by the left ventricle that goes around the body, it then returns to the right side, then the right ventricle is going to pump it out to the pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary circulation is under a lower pressure than the systemic because the lungs are so close to the heart. You got to think that the lungs are located surrounded around the heart itself and there's such a short distance that you don't have to generate that much pressure just to push that blood through the pulmonary circulation. Whereas for the systemic circulation, you have to pump blood up to the head and you've got to pump blood down to your toes as well. Obviously, gravity helps it go down to the toes, but you're not always standing. So there is a greater distance and forces of gravity that's going to influence your systemic circulation, meaning that the pressures generated by the left ventricle are going to be higher. During systole, it's going to get up to 120 versus in the right ventricle, the systolic pressure is going to be 25. Now, if we think about Ohm's law again, where the pressure equals the blood flow times your resistance or voltage equals current times resistance. If our pressure is going to be lower within the pulmonary circulation and our blood flow is going to be the same between the pulmonary and systemic circulation because remember the same amount of blood has to get pumped by both ventricles, that means the relative resistances must be different. So the pulmonary circulation has a much lower resistance than your systemic in order to cooperate with those lower pressures and keep blood flow the same. That really just ties Ohm's law back into our body circulation. It's really important to remember Ohm's law. Remember voltage is the same as pressure, current is the same as blood flow or cardiac output, and then resistance is resistance. Another difference between your pulmonary and systemic circulation is that the distribution of pressures along the pulmonary circulation is relatively more symmetrical than your systemic because your systemic circulation may increase blood flow to certain organs in times of need. For instance, it will increase blood flow to your muscles when you're exercising, but reduce it when you're sleeping. So the distribution is much more even in the lungs. You will see as we go on that there is a slight variation from the top of the lungs to the bottom of the lungs in terms of pressure and blood flow. But in general, there is a more even spread of pressure in the pulmonary capillaries. Speaking of the pulmonary capillaries, they are unique in that they are surrounded completely by gas. There is that very thin epithelial cell layer between the alveoli and the capillaries, but that provides very, very little support. So the transmural pressure becomes very important, meaning the pressure between the capillaries on the inside versus the pressure outside the capillaries. And we will cover that in more details later on in this chapter as well. The pulmonary circulation can also be thought of as having two different components in terms of the blood vessels. You have the capillaries that surround the alveoli and they're called the alveoli blood vessels. And then you've got those that are not connected to the alveoli and we call them, or at least in this textbook, they call them extra alveoli blood vessels. The blood flow within the alveolar blood vessels or the capillaries are going to be dependent on the pressure within the alveoli as well, because that is an external force pushing against the alveoli. If that's extremely high, or if the pressure within the capillary is low, it's going to collapse up blood vessel and reduce blood flow. If we talk about the extra alveolar blood vessels, the larger blood vessels, they're actually almost like attached to the lung parenchyma. So as the lung expands, that expansion actually pulls on those extra alveolar vessels and pulls them open. So you lower the resistance and you increase the blood flow. So breathing in, which is going to increase your alveolar pressure and potentially reduce blood flow within the capillaries, 
is actually going to expand the extra alveolar vessels and increase blood flow within these vessels. I don't want to confuse you by saying that you're going to reduce blood flow in the capillaries and increase blood flow in the extra alveolar vessels whenever you breathe in because that's not the case in a normal person. I'm just trying to make that differentiation between your alveolar vessels, which are dependent on your alveolar pressure, and then your extra alveolar vessels, which are connected to your parenchyma. And as your lung expands, it pulls it apart and helps to increase blood flow. If your lungs collapse, then that's going to also collapse your extra alveolar vessels and reduce your blood flow. That brings us over to pulmonary vascular resistance. We already talked about Ohm's law, and this is just Ohm's law reorganized to be focused on resistance. So resistance equals pressure divided by blood flow. So you can calculate the resistance within the pulmonary circulation if you know your pulmonary arterial pressure, you know your left atrial pressure, and you divide that by the cardiac output out the pulmonary artery. The normal resistance is going to be around about 1.7 millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. This is also called a Woods unit, so 1.7 Woods unit, typically less than three is about normal. You can also calculate systemic vascular resistance by using the same equation, but using arterial pressure, mean arterial pressure, minus your mean right atrial pressure, divided by the systemic blood flow. That's more going to be focused in a cardiovascular textbook this is obviously more focused on our respiratory system, so it doesn't go into more detail about pulmonary vascular resistance. Importantly, your pulmonary vascular resistance has the ability to reduce even further, even though your resistance is already lower than your systemic vascular resistance. If your pulmonary pressures increase, the pulmonary resistance can reduce even further to maintain normal blood flow. It is able to do that through two different mechanisms. One is recruitment, which means that there are some blood vessels within the lungs which are collapsed and are not participating with blood flow. With an increased pressure, you force open those circuits, so you open up those blood vessels, and now you have more blood vessels carrying blood flow, and that's going to reduce your resistance. So recruitment is the main mechanism to fall in pulmonary vascular resistance with an increased pulmonary pressure. The other mechanism, which is more important with extremely high pressures, is going to be distension. So this is the pulmonary vessels that are already present, already carrying some blood flow. Their vessels can distend even further, lowering resistance, increasing blood flow. So two mechanisms of reducing resistance in the face of higher pulmonary pressures are going to be recruitment and distension. Now this figure 4.6 here is illustrating an important point between our alveolar vessels and extra alveolar vessels when it comes to lung volume, like I'd mentioned just briefly before. Our optimal blood flow is going to happen where our resistance is the lowest and our lung volume is in the middle here. If we reduce our lung volume even further, that means our extra alveolar vessels are going to collapse because remember they're dependent on the lung parenchyma to keep them open by inflating and pulling them apart. So if we collapse our extra alveolar vessels, that's going to increase the resistance and reduce the blood flow as well. However, if we increase lung volume to the extreme, that's going to increase our alveolar pressure and also stretch apart our alveolar vessels. So then that's going to increase the resistance within the capillaries and overall increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. So the optimal vascular resistance is going to occur at the lung volume, which occurs during normal breathing. It also mentions that our extra alveolar vessels contain the smooth muscle that is able to contract and increase our pulmonary vascular resistance. That contraction can be stimulated by various vasoactive substances. So for instance, serotonin, histamine, norepinephrine, endothelin, but also due to hypoxia, which is discussed later on in this chapter, that can also induce vascular resistance or vasoconstriction of our extra alveolar vessels. There are also substances that can cause vasodilation and reduce our pulmonary vascular resistance, which includes acetylcholine, calcium channel blockers, nitric oxide, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, which is sildenafil, and prostacycline as well. There is a short paragraph about the FIC principle. The FIC principle is the way that you can calculate cardiac output 
through the, your pulmonary circulation. This is done by acknowledging that the oxygen consumption per minute is going to be equal to the amount of oxygen taken up by the lungs per minute. If you rearrange that equation, you then get that pulmonary blood flow is going to be equivalent to oxygen consumption divided by the oxygen differential between your arterial and venous pulmonary vessels. Once again, it doesn't go into too much details about this because this is more your cardiovascular system, but at least the main thing to know here is that you can calculate pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary cardiac output via the FIC principle. And then all you need to know is the oxygen consumption and then your oxygen content within your mixed venous and also your arterial system. Next, we talk about the distribution of blood flow within the lungs. Now this does change depending on the aspect of the lungs. We've talked about this in a previous chapter, but gravity is the main component here. If you are above the heart, that means you need a higher pressure to push that blood up and around the lungs. If you're below the heart, that means that you're going to have gravity on your side and technically you need a lower pressure to have that blood be able to pass through the lung tissue. So you can see this equation here, which is using radioactive xenon, you can see that blood flow increases from the bottom of the lungs and then decreases in a linear function as you go higher within the lungs. And that just depends on whether you're standing or lying down. Just whichever part of the lungs is at the highest point will have the lowest blood flow. Whichever is at the lowest point will have the highest blood flow. Just think about it with gravity. That's really the simplest way to think about that. They split it up into three different zones here, and we'll try to keep it as simplified as possible so you don't get too confused. But this is giving you three zones where the top part of the lung is zone one and the bottom part of the lung is zone three. Zone one is going to have the lowest blood flow because your alveolar pressure is higher than your arterial and venous capillary pressure. So your alveoli are effectively collapsing that capillary. In a normal person, there is enough pulmonary pressure to just get some blood flow through there. So it's not going to be completely squished with no blood flow at all, but effectively your alveolar pressure is higher than your alveolar capillary pressure, which is going to reduce your blood flow. In zone two, this is saying that your arterial pressure is the highest, your arterial capillary pressure. Next highest is your alveolar pressure. And then the last is going to be your venous capillary pressure. This is a interesting zone because your blood flow is going to be dependent between the pressure gradient between your arterial pressure and your alveolar pressure rather than your arterial and your venous like you normally think about. So in, in order to increase blood flow, you need to either increase your arterial pressure within your capillary or reduce your alveolar pressure within the alveolar space. Zone three is where your capillary pressure is going to be higher than your alveolar pressure. So that includes both the arterial end and the venous end. That means that blood flow is going to be dependent on the pressure between your arterial end of the capillary and the venous end, just like you normally think about, and blood flow is going to be the greatest. They do give you a little example of this in an experimental setting where you have a red rubber tube going through a gas chamber, but that's effectively showing the same mechanism that we have already described in an experimental manner. They then also bring in this other zone called zone four. Zone four is taking into account our extra alveolar vessels. So if the lung is completely collapsed and your extra alveolar vessels are also collapsed because of that, that's going to reduce your blood flow and that's typically going to happen at the base of the lung. So zone four is a reduction in blood flow because of a collapsed lung from your extra alveolar vessels being collapsed. Next, we're going to talk about the active control of circulation. A super important factor to know with the lungs is that the pulmonary circulation or your pulmonary vessels are going to respond to hypoxia with vasoconstriction. That is opposite to your systemic circulation. Remember, your systemic circulation, if a muscle or some portion of your body is hypoxic, there are mechanisms in place to increase blood flow via vasodilation. Your lungs are opposite. Your lungs are going to respond to hypoxia by causing vasoconstriction and reducing blood flow to that region. This is because you do not want to send blood 
to an alveoli that does not have any gas within it. If you have a collapsed alveoli and there's no oxygen going down to it and no ability for the alveoli to get rid of carbon dioxide, there is no point in sending your blood flow there. That means if you do send your blood flow there, you're going to have blood that does not get oxygenated and also does not get rid of its carbon dioxide re-enter the circulation and go around the body. So you want to respond to hypoxia or regions which do not have oxygen within them by vasoconstriction and reducing your blood flow. This is seemingly a local response. They don't know the direct mechanism just yet, but it seems to be due to an increased cytosol of calcium, which is going to trigger smooth muscle contraction. It's not a linear function. It's really once you get to an alveolar partial pressure of oxygen of less than 70 that your blood flow starts to dramatically reduce. And there are some vasoactive substances that may also play a role. For instance, nitric oxide is going to cause vasodilation and increased blood flow. The mechanism behind this is via endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which converts arginine and oxygen into your nitric oxide that can diffuse across, activate your guanate cyclase, form cyclic GMP that is going to then induce vasodilation. The reason or the stimuli for nitric oxide production is going to be shear forces, so a lot of shear stress from let's say turbulent blood flow or something along those lines, which is then going to tell that muscle to dilate, expand and increase blood flow through that region. However, we also have some vasoactive substances that cause vasoconstriction. That includes endothelin one and thromboxane A2. They are going to do the opposite and stimulate the constriction of your blood vessels. With pathological disease, where you have pathological high pulmonary pressures or pulmonary hypertension, there is typically an upregulation of endothelium, upregulation of thromboxane A2, and a downregulation of nitric oxide. So you are unable to reduce the resistance within your pulmonary circulation in the face of high pulmonary pressures. They also mentioned some other reasons for having vasoconstriction. So during fetal life, our pulmonary vascular resistance is extremely high because you're clearly not using your lungs when you're in the womb. So your lungs are going to be collapsed and vasoconstricted and most of your blood flow is actually diverted away from your lungs via the patent ductus arteriosus, the fossa ovalis, etc. And that patent ductus arteriosus is actually kept open by prostaglandins, specifically prostaglandin E2. These examples may be a little higher level than what you need to know, but it's just illustrating these points. At high altitude, you're going to have a low partial pressure of oxygen entering your lungs globally. So all your lung tissue is going to have a low partial pressure of oxygen. So you may have just global vasoconstriction and increased pulmonary arterial pressure. And that's a part of high altitude sickness. There are also some other factors for causing vasoconstriction such as acidemia, and then also increased sympathetic outflow along with iron deficiency. Next, we're gonna talk about the water balance within the lung. And this is the equation for saying, are we going to have increased water leaving the capillary into the interstitial space and worse yet into the alveolar space? Or where is that fluid going to go? That fluid movement is dependent on this equation here, which is Starling's equation. So the first part, which has the filtration coefficient, which is just a constant, but is associated with the hydrostatic pressure. So that is the hydrostatic pressure within the capillary and then also within the interstitium. There's a higher hydrostatic pressure within the capillary compared to the interstitium, then you're gonna have the movement of fluid out of your capillary into your interstitium. That is typically what does happen, just by the way. The second part of this equation takes into account your oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure within the capillary and then the oncotic pressure within the interstitium. That is how much protein essentially is within that compartment. If there's more proteins, that means there's a greater force holding on to the water within that, that compartment. So if you have a lower interstitial oncotic pressure, that means you're allowing more fluid to enter the interstitium. In general, you do have a net movement of fluid out of the capillary into the interstitium, but then you have lymph tissue or your lymphatic system that's going to take all of that extra fluid, take it to your lymph node and get rid of it, so then it doesn't go into your alveolar space. If you have a pathological condition, let's say like heart failure, where you have an increased hydrostatic pressure within your capillary and excess 
fluid entering the interstitium, that might overwhelm the lymphatic system and allow fluid to enter your alveolar space as well. And then that results in fluid accumulation in the lungs or heart failure. All disease processes that cause a fluid accumulation within the lungs can be explained by a change in the Starling's forces. So let's say you have a hypoalbuminemia and a low protein level, so your colloid osmotic pressure within your capillary reduces. That's going to favor the equation for increased fluid leakage out of the capillary. Having fluid leak into the interstitium isn't that big of a deal because once again, our lymphatics can take away. The big issue is when it leaks into the alveoli space because that interferes with gas exchange. Moving on to other functions of the pulmonary circulation. We obviously know that the chief function is to act as a blood gas barrier and help oxygen diffuse into the blood and carbon dioxide get out. There are some other functions as well. It does act as somewhat of a reservoir for blood and that's through the mechanisms of recruitment and distension as well. It is really just a giant filter for our blood, so any blood clots that may form somewhere around the body or little bits of fat droplets that enter into our systemic circulation will eventually make it around to the pulmonary circulation and get lodged into the lung tissue. Those small little portions are going to get filtered out and the lung tissue gets rid of it so then it doesn't enter into the systemic circulation again and go up to the brain where obviously our, our brain is much more vital and we can't lose blood flow to portions of the brain. So your lungs are like a filter for your body. Now you obviously don't want to filter too large of substances or else that's going to impact your gaseous exchange but those small everyday pieces of material is going to be filtered out. The lung does also have metabolic functions and it's unique in that it's the only organ that receives the entire circulation because it has to. Um, the pulmonary circulation is, has to get the same output as the left side of the heart or the systemic circulation. Therefore, it does have some of these metabolic functions. A big one is going to be the conversion of angiotensin 1 into the potent vasoconstrictor that is angiotensin 2 via the enzyme ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE also inactivates some other molecules such as bradykinin, so it actually inactivates most of the bradykinin. The lungs can also inactivate serotonin, prostaglandin, so E1, E2, and F2 alpha. Once again, prostaglandin E2 has a role in the fetus to relax that patent ductus arteriosus and keep blood flow away from the lungs. If that doesn't make any sense to you, that's probably a little higher than what you need to know for this textbook. The fetal circulation may come up later, but in general, just think the lungs have metabolic functions of inactivating some molecules, such as some prostaglandins. It does also secrete immunoglobulins, so IgA, within your bronchial mucus, and that helps to have a defense against some infection right at the barrier. So obviously our airways are one of the first line of defenses to bacteria trying to enter our body. IgA is one of those immunoglobulins or antibodies that can protect against that. And that brings us to the end of this chapter. There are key concepts down the bottom here and also a clinical scenario with some questions. So these questions, the answers will be provided within the description. Feel free to pause to actually see all of these questions. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this chapter. Feel free to drop a comment and we'll see you in the next one.